All right, the part of the, part of the chapter we're going to be focusing on here is right the last three verses here. This is talking about the king. And uh, we know that the, the Bible, God's method of government was not to, to ordain a king, a human king, because God was supposed to be the king. And that's why he had judges set up in order to, to interpret the law, in order to determine, you know, people who are guilty, those who are innocent, and apply God's law to what needs to be done. But God knew, God knows everything. God has foreknowledge. And, you know, earlier in this chapter, in verse number 14, it says, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as the nations that are about me, He's saying, you know, when this comes to pass, because he knows it's going to happen, there's going to be a day where they're going to forsake God as their king and want to just have that human king. He gives them some instructions. Since he knows it's going to happen, even though it's not his perfect will, he says, okay, if you're going to do this, then this is the way that, you know, this is the manner of king that you need to have. These are some requirements in order for you to have someone that's going to be ruling over you. This is what needs to happen with him. Now, jump ahead here. We're going to skip some of these because I just want to focus on one aspect here. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So one of the things that's commanded of the king is that he needs to make his own copy of the law, of God's law. He needs to write it out himself he needs to go get a copy from the priests, from the Levites. He needs to, to take it. He needs to write out a copy for himself. And then it says he needs to read therein all the days of his life. That is one of the things that's expected of the king. I mean, what to God, we don't have a king, but like a ruler. Can you imagine if a ruler wrote down even just the Old Testament laws, right? Just one portion of the Bible, any portion of the Bible, <laughs> and copied it out for themselves and then read every single day of their life from God's word. And he tells them why. Why, why do I have to do this? And, and at the end of verse number 19, it says, he shall read there in all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord as God. When you read the Bible every day, you're going to learn a proper and a healthy fear of the Lord. You're going to read how powerful God is. You're going to read God's judgment upon those that, that just disobey and disregard him. You're going to read all these various things about the Lord. When you're reading every single day, you're going to gain a proper fear of the Lord. And it says to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. When you're in God's word, when you're reading it every day, you're going to know what God's statutes are. You're going to know what his law is and what they say because you're reading it every day. It's going, to be, it's going to be normal for you to think in your head, oh, wow, here's what God says. Here are God's commandments. So in order for you to keep doing them and, and to do right by God and to be obedient on his commandments, you need to know what they are. And by reading it every day, you're going to know those things. And then in verse 20, it says that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. Now, we know, especially with kings and those that have authority over a large amount of people, it's a lot easier for pride to come in and for you to get lifted up and think that you're so much better than everyone else because you're telling everyone what to do that you all of a sudden get this big head about you. But when you're reading the Bible every day, he said, I don't want your heart being lifted up above your brethren because you're just a person too. Yes, you are in this position, but that doesn't make you any better than anybody else. You're still a sinner too, and you need to be obedient unto your king just like everybody else. Reading your Bible every single day will do that. And it says that he turned not aside from the commandment because, again, the, the tendency, the, the natural sinful tendency is going to be get lifted up in pride and then turn aside and make up my own commandments and just ignore what God has for me. It's a lot harder to do that when you're opening up Scripture every single day and reading from it. 
to turn aside from the commandments to the right hand and to the left to the end that he may prolong his days in the kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel, saying, if, if, if a king can do this and, and can follow these commandments and can write out his own copy of the law and read therein every single day of his life, he's going to prolong his days and he's going to prolong the days of his children because God's going to have respect on him and his heart's not going to get lifted up and he's going to keep himself from falling into all kinds of snares and problems and traps. Now, this month, if you haven't gathered it already, is our new challenge. So we have 31 days in the, in the month of May, and our challenge is a Bible reading challenge. I want you to read your Bibles, and we're going to get into a little bit more of the details a little bit later. But I just want to point out and show you and prove to you before I give you the exact challenge, I'm going to give that to you at the end, what, what I'm asking of you and, and what the challenge is going to be. I want you to see, first of all, just the importance of reading the Bible and how often and what we see in the Bible as what is a good number. What, you, know, you, you think, well, of course we should read our Bible, right? I mean, a, a, any saved person probably going to realize, yes, we should. But then the question comes up, well, how often should we read our Bible? How much? How, you know, how much per day or whatever? Here we're seeing an explicit example and, and keep your finger here in Deuteronomy. Turn if you would to Revelation chapter 1. Here we see an explicit example of the king that was required to, you, you know, you need to read every single day of your life. It's a daily thing that needs to happen. But you might say, yeah, but that was just for the king. I'm not a king, so, so do I really need to read my Bible every day? First of all, I would just say this. Any standards set forth in the Bible really should be applicable to everybody. I mean, it, what these are is that, you, you know, it's a way of eliminating people like, well, you can't be king if you're not at least reading your Bible every day. The same way that there's requirements for the bishop or for the deacons, right? It goes through all these things and it's like, look, if you're at least not doing this, then you can't fill that office. But that's not to say that that's what God wants, you know, like, that, that, well, that's what God wants for them, but not for everyone else. No, God's standard is the same for everybody. The amount of Bible reading that God wants you to do is just as much as the Bible reading he wants me to do and everybody else to do. His standard is the same. But what he's saying, what these limitations are, what he's putting in here is saying, well, if you're not at least doing this, then I don't even want you to be in the position of a king or a pastor or whatever. But he wants all of us to be doing the work. He doesn't want just one person doing the work and everyone else not doing the work. He wants everybody doing it. And look, if you say, well, I'm not the king, you're in, uh, keep your finger there in Deuteronomy 17, and had you turn to Revelation chapter 1, look at verse number 5. Revelation 1, 5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, look at this, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion, forever and ever. By being saved, by being washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, it says that he has washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests. You are a king, you are a priest if you're saved, according to the Bible. And the reason why is because one day when Jesus Christ comes back, we are going to be ruling and reigning with him. He's going to set us up as, you know, to rule, to reign. We are kings and priests unto God and his father through the blood of Jesus Christ. So don't say that, well, I'm not a king. It doesn't apply to me. Yes, you are. In this sense, you are. Flip back if you were to Deuteronomy and turn if you were to Deuteronomy chapter number eight. So knowing and believing that there is going to come a day in the future that we are going to be ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ, let's be ready for that. Let's be ready to take on that job. Let's be in the habit and in the practice of reading our Bible every day anyways, as it is. If it's good for the king, it's good for you. Read, the, read your Bible every single day. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're going to see here a little bit about um, some of the explanation behind God providing manna unto the children of Israel. When the children of Israel were led out by Moses... Of, from Egypt, they were led into the wilderness. They were led out into a place of, of, of a desert where they weren't, you know, 
they were used, they had their homes, they had their dwelling, everything else in Egypt, right? Just like you would here, you know, you have your, your houses, your, your supermarkets, everything else. You go, you're, you're growing your own food maybe, and you're preparing for yourself. But when they were led out of Egypt, it's not like they had all of this gear and food. Remember, they had to leave in haste. So they had the Passover lamb that they ate that provided them some sustenance so they could get out of there. And then they brought their unleavened bread with them and they were eating just like unleavened bread. They didn't have all of their supplies and food and everything else, you know, wagons full of all this food to bring with them. They just had to go out by faith that God's going to them, lead them out and deliver them and bring them into the promised land. Now, as a result of their sin, they ended up staying in that wilderness for an extended period of time. But they, they didn't have food. They weren't cultivating crops. I mean, they were literally in the middle of the wilderness. So God had to provide for them, and he did. And that's why he gave them manna. And that's what they called the food that God provided for them. The Bible says it's angel's food. It's food that, that God, just like when the, when the dew comes up, or dew comes out on the earth, and there's, um, you, know, you find the little droplets of water and stuff, of dew on the, on the plants and everything outside. Well, instead of there just being water, there was food. So God just made this food essentially to appear on the ground and all they had to do in the morning was go out and collect this food and that was enough to sustain them every single day. And on Friday, he gave them twice as much and it, he didn't allow it to, to stay. He, they weren't allowed to save it. The manna was something that you got it that day and whatever you got that day, you ate it that day and the next day you got more. You could not store it up. If you decided to store it, because people did this, you know, God told them not to do it, but people always challenged God, didn't believe him, didn't have that proper faith, and just questioned him anyways and did whatever they wanted to do, and they were always found out wrong, and God was always found out true. But if they were to collect that manna and say, well, I'm just going to get a bunch of manna today and save it up, the next day it would breed worms and it stank and it went bad and you couldn't use it, it was good for nothing. So every single day you had to go out and collect your manna. And the only, the only exception God made for that was for the Sabbath day because he didn't want anyone working on the Sabbath. So not even going out and collecting that food. So the miracle was, you know, on Friday they go out, they collect their food and they could collect twice as much so that they don't have to go out on Saturday. And when they collected twice as much, it didn't breed worms, it didn't stink, it didn't go bad. I mean, it's amazing. Why would it go bad every other day but that one day? Well, because God was involved because God was miraculously feeding the people. But that's, you know, I'm not going to get all into all the amazing things about manna. But what we're going to find out about manna here, there is a good explanation here in Deuteronomy chapter 8 of what God was doing besides providing for his children, besides just giving them food, you know, in order to survive because he knows that the body needs that. There was other teaching involved with the manna. Look at verse number one of Deuteronomy chapter eight. The Bible reads, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And you remember, this is the same thing that Jesus Christ then said back to Satan when Satan was trying to tempt him in the wilderness and you know, he was fasting and he was in the desert and he's there 40 days and 40 nights and he's like, oh, well, if you're the son of God, why don't you just command this stone to be made bread? You know, why don't you, just, why don't you feed yourself? He's trying to appeal to the lust of his flesh and try to get him to just, to just eat some bread, you know, and break his fast early from what he was doing for God. And that's when he quotes back and says, you know, man, you know, as written, man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And this is something that the Lord was using to teach, to teach the children of Israel. He said, first of all, when they, when they were in the wilderness, they're there for 40 years, in verse 2, it says, you know, this was to humble you. Because they still had some pride. They needed to be brought down. They needed to be brought low and be humbled and realize they don't have anything out in the wilderness. 
They can't support themselves. You need to rely on God in the wilderness. And they had to rely on him. And even, you know, and after 40 years they came out, their shoes never got old and, and you know, broke. Like he sustained everything that they needed. God sustained for them. And that's humbling when you're relying on someone else. See, the, the person who's proud is the person who does everything themselves. Everything. I, you know, I've worked for everything. I've accumulated this wealth. I've done everything on my own. And no acknowledgement to the Lord. No acknowledging that God is in my life. That God is, is, is looking over. God has blessed me. God has given me these opportunities. Just, I did this. I did that. I did everything. And look, I'm all for working hard. We should. But we need to remain humble and realize that God is the one ultimately that gives us our blessings, that gives us our opportunities, that's given us the gifts that we have and the talents that we have in order to, uh, to, to provide and do the things that we have to do. And he kept the children of Israel for 40 years in the wilderness, one reason, to humble them. And it says to prove thee, which is like a testing. He's proving them to know what's in thine heart. He's saying, I want to know what's in your heart when it gets down to it. So he led them around in the, in the wilderness, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. So are you going to keep his commandments? Because at first they didn't, which is one of the reasons why they were led around the wilderness for 40 years to begin with, because they were disobedient. After seeing all the miracles and all the plagues in Egypt, after seeing everything that happened, after seeing the Red Sea parted, after walking through on dry ground, after every single thing that happened, they still were disobedient and they still continued to question the Lord and to question his commandments. And he's saying, you know what? For 40 years, you had to rely on me. It's a humbling experience, and it's a time, are you going to listen to what I say or not? And he says, he humbled thee, verse 3, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know. And this is where the application of the manna comes in. He says, the reason why I fed thee with manna, that you might know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God of the Lord doth man live. The food is important. He said, it's, it's not bread alone. We need bread. We need, we need food every day. Where we, need, we need that in order to survive. That's a part of our, our physical, natural body. It's the way things work. We need that in order to continue. But he says, that's not all you need. And he's not talking about just water. Right? Food and water. Physically, we know we need that. But he says, it's not the bread only, but you need every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. That's how you're going to live. Now, he, the man is referred to in other places, and I'm not going to go too deep into this. John 6, 63 reads, I'm just going to quote this for you, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That was Jesus Christ saying, the words that I'm speaking to you are life. Your life is found in this. Our life is found literally in God's word. Yes, we need the, the physical food and stuff to, in order for our bodies to survive, but he says that's not all you need. You need God's word. That's where life is. You need this life every day. And the same way that they had their manna every day, we ought to be getting God's word every day. I mean, he, he's equating this manna and this food with his word with God's word and believing God's word and trusting in God's word and receiving God's word. Think about how often you eat. Probably two or three times a day, four times, I don't know. I mean, whatever. People do different things with their, their eating you know, habits and schedules or whatever. As much as you eat food, you really should be getting God's word. You should be receiving from God his manna. I mean, if you think about it, it, it makes sense. He's equating here the, the manna with the, with the, you know, the food with the, with the word of God. And you think about the various applications that happen with the children of Israel. You know, he wants you in it every day. He wants you to get your daily bread from the Lord. He doesn't want you just to say, well, I'm behind, and then gorge yourself and read a whole bunch on one day. And I'll tell you why. Because if you try to do that, you know, the... the Obviously, it's good to read your Bible. But getting in the practice of reading every day is way better than taking one day a week and say, well, I'm just going to read a lot and then not read at all for the rest of the week. What you're doing is like you're binging and then you're starving yourself. 
We need God's word continually on a daily basis. One of the reasons why he used this example of manna. That's why it applies so well. You know, the people that, that wanted to, to get a whole bunch at once, it didn't do them any good the next day. You can read a lot at once, but what's going to happen is, I mean, just like overeating, at some point you're going to be so full that you can't really receive anymore. And I've experienced this for myself. I've dedicated lots of time. You know, I listen to the Bible a lot, but there comes a point where I just have to turn it off because I'm just not getting anything anymore. I mean, I, I can listen and listen and listen and listen. It's great. But at some point, I'm just like, I, I just, I just can't, I can't take it anymore. I mean, there's a lot there, but there's a limit. And when you're reading the Bible, same thing. And you could read and read and read. At some point, your eyes are going to be glossing over and you're, you're not even going to be getting what, you know, what you're reading. It's not going to be absorbed as well. It's important to, that's why it's so important to make sure you get some every day and not try to fill up all at once to last you for the whole week or whole month or whole year or whatever. So the habit of daily is very important. We need to be receiving, because it's good. It's our life. We need every single day. You don't know what's going to be profiting you from day to day. We need to be just have this coming in regularly, hearing from God every single day. It, it, when you get into these habits of, of going without, it's easier to just forget that it even is your life, that it is just as important as your daily bread of food. And not get it at all. And that's going to lead you astray, guaranteed. Reading the Bible is going to keep you humble. Just as much as the children of Israel should have been humble when they ate manna in the wilderness because they had to rely on God for their sustenance, if you rely on hearing from God every day, it's going to keep you humble. Let's keep reading here in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says, When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God, for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. He's saying, beware. It's a warning. Beware. Verse 11. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God. See, you might start out doing good. You might start out relying on God and receiving from his word, reading the Bible, getting it in you, and God might start blessing you, right? You're doing good. You're on the right path. Everything's going great. He's blessing you. Everything's going well. But then you turn around, you got all this stuff. And you start to think that you're something special. That I've done this with the work of my hands. And uh, the Bible reading, the receiving from the Lord starts getting on the back burner, not quite as important. I've got all this other stuff going on. I've got all my goods and my wealth and everything else to see to. I'll get to that when I have time. And this is what leads people to forget the Lord their God, forget what he's done for them. And this is the warning. He's saying, look, I, did, I provided everything for you. I loved you enough. I fed you with manna in the wilderness. I proved you. I humbled you. Don't get lifted back up into pride again. And in order to remember, verse 18 says, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. How are you going to remember him if, if he's not in your mind every day? You're not going to. The way to keep God in your remembrance is by getting in his word and reading it daily. When you're reading the Bible every day, you're not going to be forgetting about God. And I'll tell you what, maybe throughout the day, you read the Bible in the morning. Throughout the day, maybe you start to forget about God. 
Well, maybe you should add in your schedule to read a little bit more then. Take a little break in the middle of the, of the day and, and just read and read a little bit, read a lot, you know, whatever. Read a chapter, read something to keep God in your thoughts and to be mindful of him and mindful of all that he has for you. I mean, you eat three times and you take a break to eat lunch usually, right? You eat breakfast in the morning. Why not start out with some Bible reading as well? You take a break in the middle of the day because you're getting hungry and you want some food. Well, why not incorporate a little bit of Bible then too so you're not forgetting the Lord throughout the day? And then in the evening, what do you do? You sit down and you have dinner. Well, why not have a little bit of Scripture too? Right? That way, you're going to be a lot less likely to forget the Lord your God. I mean, every day at a minimum, you know, you should be starting off your day or whatever, ending your day however you want to do it, making sure you're hearing from God to not forget Him. But even more than that, you could be throughout the whole day just, just keeping God in your mind that you don't forget Him. That, why? Well, because God's Word provides us instruction. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. God's Word provides us instruction. We know this from the book of Proverbs. All the instruction and the wisdom and the knowledge that comes from the Lord. He tells us what to do. God's Word, the more you're in God's Word, the more you're going to make the right decisions. Because you're going to know what the right decision is. Oftentimes, one of the biggest things you know, people want to go to the pastor about or talk to other people about, say, I don't know what to do in this situation. I don't know what's right. I just want to be right with God, but I don't know what to do. The more you're reading your Bible, the more you're going to know what to do and you won't have to ask anyone else because God's Word, look, God's Word has the answer to everything. Everything, all of your problems, everything we have to do in this life is found in the Bible. God has given us that instruction and you may not find explicitly where it's stated in my particular situation, do this, but the principles are there. The way that God wants you to behave and in all these various situations you can derive from the principles laid out in the Bible. And when you're reading every day, you're going to get that in your mind and, and get that memorized and, and just know what the, what the Bible says about things. You say, well, in this particular situation, it's kind of like this situation in the Bible, so that's what, what was told to do, so this is what I should do in this situation. And from that instruction, we'll be able to make proper judgment. And don't be deceived by the world that says, judge not, judge not. Look, we need to make judgment. Everybody makes a judgment. You're a hypocrite if you say just you can't judge anything. Everybody makes a judgment. Anytime someone talks to you, you're judging whether you believe what they're saying to you. I mean, it's natural. It's, it's normal. It's what we should be doing. You shouldn't just believe and accept every single thing that every person tells you. You judge. Is this right or is this wrong? Does this match up with what I've already heard before? Or is this person lying to me? There's a lot of people that lie out there. We need to judge whether or not what we're being told is true. Thank God we have at least one source here that is always true, that we know is true. This is established to be true. God's word is true. We can rely on this as being truth. And this is what guides us in our decision making. This is what gives us, helps us with our judgment. We need to judge regularly. And in Acts chapter 17, we see some Christians, we see some Bible believing Christians that did just that and they were honorable. It says in verse 11, Acts 17, 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They were being taught by the apostles. They were being taught by Apostle Paul, by the disciples. They were coming in. They were preaching to him. And this was in Berea. And it says they were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Thessalonica is where another church was established. But the reason why they were more noble is because they received the word. They were ready in their mind to receive God's word. They were ready for it. And the reason why they were ready for it is because they were in his word. And they were checking and searching and they searched the scriptures daily they didn't search the scriptures once a week they didn't search the scriptures once a month they searched the scriptures daily what are these things are so is this true i don't know let's search the scripture let's find out let's read what does the bible say well it says this right here and they're and they're in it regularly to know whether or not they're receiving the truth in order for you to know what's right and wrong and to have the proper judgment to determine that you need to be in the scriptures daily you, I mean, we're inundated with information all the time from the news, from other people, what have you, right? 
all kinds of sources of information. We need to have a readiness of mind and search. Does this line up with the Bible? Does this line up with scripture? Because I don't want to be deceived. I know that this is true. Something else is being reported to me. I don't know if that's true. <clears throat> you say, well, the Bible's not going to tell me if a bomb was dropped in a certain country. You're right, it won't. But you know what's going to help you to do, though? Help you to analyze the source of where you're getting your information from. Is this even a reliable source at all or not? Based on everything else and other things that you're seeing from them, right? right. It's important. Turn if you go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Because, you know, we saw, and you, know, you say, well, that was the Old Testament. The king needs to read his Bible every day. Yeah, you know, uh, and, and you may not buy the, well, um, and, you know, I think it's true. We're, we're kings and priests. I mean, that's what the Bible says in Revelation. But maybe, maybe that's not convincing for you because you just don't want to read your Bible every day. Well, look at what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 15, New Testament which we already saw in Acts 17 that the, that the Christians that were searching the scriptures daily. But look at 1 Peter 3.15. The Bible says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts <coughs> and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. In order to be ready to give an answer, you ought to have the information and the knowledge in order to back up your answer. You need to give an explanation, a reason as to why. Why? Why do I believe this? Why do I do the things I do? Why do I live the way I live? Because it's found in God's word here or here and you know the reference. You know you could point them to it. You could say, well, it's right here. You're not going to know the references and show them why and provide a real good answer unless you're in the word and you're, and you're reading it every day. Because I'll tell you what, a good answer is not going to be, well, because the pastor said so. You're not going to convince people with it. You might convince a few people, I don't know, but you're, it's, not, it's not a very good, a good reason for someone to believe you. Hopefully that doesn't work for you. Well, my pastor said this, so, and he's real smart. He's, he, he studied this out. That's not a good reason to believe anybody. That's why the, the Bereans were more noble because they didn't accept just what Paul said. They search the scriptures. Well, does this line up with what the Bible says? Oh, okay, yeah, it does. We're ready to receive it then because this matches up perfectly with the truth. Turn if you would to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And verse number 16, the Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. God's Word provides us. It says, it says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's, it's God breathed. These are the words of the Lord, all Scripture. It's profitable for us. It's profitable for doctrine, right, to know uh, to, to get good doctrine, what's right and what's wrong, to, for reproof, for, for proving, right? Proving what's right and what's wrong, for correction, to, to help us out, to correct us when we're doing what's wrong, and for instruction in righteousness. So not only to correct us when we're doing what's wrong, but to show us the right way. Hey, these are this, this is the way that I want you to do things. You know, we're always asking God for things. We want things from God, but are we listening to him? You know, oftentimes we won't find ourselves in a time of need if we just followed his steps. Now, I'm not saying that that's always the case, of course. I mean, there, there, you know, if we live godly in Christ Jesus, the Bible says we shall suffer persecution. It's going to happen that we may have a need where we're going to want to go to God or we'll have other family members or other people maybe that and maybe they're not living right with God or whatever. Who knows what's going on in your life where you have a need or you want to go to God in prayer, of course. But here's the thing. Oftentimes, we bring things upon ourselves. This is, it's not every time, but oftentimes that is the case. Oftentimes we wouldn't experience some of the things we experience uh, if we hadn't done, gotten into sin and gotten into our own, our, made our own mess. And the thing is that God's word provides us with the instruction to not fall into those traps, to not get sucked into those sins, to show us, hey, this is wrong. You shouldn't do that. <clears throat> Turn 
And it says that the man of God, so the scripture is profitable for all these various reasons, so that the man of God may be perfect. This is to help perfect you, to make you complete, to make you whole, by, by, uh, and truly furnish unto all good works. You say, I want to do more for God. Get in your Bible more and read. You'll know exactly what you need to do. Proverbs 4.13 says, Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Instruction, the ways that you need to walk, is the ways of life. God's word is life. It's funny how, it's not funny, it's, it's amazing how everything fits together so perfectly in God's word. God's word provides us instruction. It provides us life. Um, turn, if you would, to Psalm 50. Psalm 50. Proverbs 6, 20 says, My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou wakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Just having this understanding about God's word, about the commandment being a lamp, it lights up your way. The law is light. God's law, knowing the Bible, knowing God's law is a light for you to shine, to, to help you know what's right and what's wrong, to see what's coming up ahead, to, to know, to, to avoid the traps and the pitfalls. And it's for reproofs, reproofs of instruction are the way of life. It's so important to understand, to understand the value found in Scripture, God's Word. To reverence and, and, to, and to read and to want to have this every day of your life. When you, when you really understand the value of what is provided in Scripture. Some people get discouraged and say, well, I just don't understand it. I try to read and I don't get it. If you can at least understand the value found in it. It's worth investing more time to make sure you can understand it. To, to, I'll tell you what, the more you read it, the more you'll get it, and the more you will start to understand. You know, a lot of people, and, and I mean, first of all, the Holy Spirit's going to guide you in all truth, but you got to realize also that precept comes upon precept, line upon line. It's something that happens slowly. It's not, it's not something that happens overnight. You don't just like download all knowledge into your brain just, just plugging into the Bible and just, I've got all the information now, like they did in the Matrix or whatever, right? It's not like that. It doesn't work that way. We need to actually invest time. It requires a little bit of work. It requires some study. You need to, to read this book. And if there's parts that you don't understand, that's okay. Don't let that discourage you. But make sure you're staying in daily and reading regularly because what and praying to God will open up the knowledge to you, whatever you didn't understand before, to help you to understand uh, in the future what, what he's talking about in different areas of the scripture. Proverbs 12 1 says, Whoso loveth instruction loveth knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. We should love the Bible, love the instructions found here, and we'll be loving knowledge. I do turn to Psalm 50, right? It's the wicked that do not care for the instruction of the Lord. Psalm 50, verse number 16 says, But unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statute, so that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth, seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words behind thee? We shouldn't be hating instruction, God's word. We should love getting in God's word, love reading it, and not hate it and be like, Oh, I don't want to, I, I hate reading the Bible. The Bible says that the wicked are the ones that hate instruction. The wicked are the ones that cast God's word. I, 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 what do I have to do with God's word? And you just throw it behind your back like it's nothing. We're almost done here. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, we're going to see Jesus rebuking the Pharisees for not reading the Bible. And they also put the commandments of men above the commandments of God. Because they cared more about their own words than they did about the words of the Lord. Matthew chapter 12. We're almost done. This is one of a few different places where Jesus actually rebukes people for not knowing the word of God. Matthew 12, 1 reads, At that time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples weren't hungry and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day.
But he said unto them, look at what he says. This is his answer. So they're accusing Jesus' disciples for breaking the Sabbath because they're, they're, they're walking, and as they're walking, they're picking up ears of corn and eating them because they're hungry, right? So they say, oh, oh wait a minute. You know, aren't you going to say some of your disciples? They're, they're breaking the law, right? The Pharisees were just, were trying to get out of them about it. But Jesus answers them. He says, have ye not read what David did? Say, well, di didn't, didn't you already read in the Bible? I mean, if you'd already read, if you'd already been reading the scripture, you'd already know that they're not in sin, that they're not breaking the Sabbath day because the Bible already covers this. Scripture already covers the situation. Have you read the Bible? If you would have read, you'd know. But I don't think you've read. I don't think you know because you're not, you're, you're not understanding at all. And they didn't understand the Bible. He says, have you not read what David did when he was in hunger and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread? which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them that were with him, which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day." Now, some people will say, well, Jesus just made an exception because he's greater than everything and he's God. But that's not the case, right? Because he says, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Some people will look at this and say, oh, well, he, I mean, of course he could say that or do that because he's God. But that's not what he was saying. In the verse before, they says, you would not have condemned the guiltless. He already said they weren't guilty. It's not like he's forgiving them for doing this because they were with him. They didn't break the Sabbath because it's allowed he's in, in other places too and this is an entire sermon just based on the Sabbath where they didn't understand the spirit of the law the whole purpose of the law he says it's okay basically he said, he said it's okay to do good on the Sabbath it's okay it's okay to circumcise a child on the Sabbath day you say yeah but he's doing work yeah but that, I mean you're not understanding at all then why God instituted the Sabbath day and following with the spirit of the law as well as with the letter. He didn't, he didn't make good things, doing good. I mean, if someone's just dying in a ditch and it's a Sabbath day, you don't just leave them there to die. You help them out, right? I mean, if someone's, you're, you're, you're hungry, it's not, and it's not that they didn't prepare for themselves for the Sabbath, right, and were just lazy. They were doing the work of the Lord. They were going around and healing people and preaching the gospel, and he's saying, look, it's a Sabbath day, but there's corn, it's not like they're really, I mean, it's not like they're really working anyways. I mean, they're grabbing an ear of corn and, and eating it as they're doing the work of the Lord, as they're following Jesus Christ. He's saying that is not a sin. They were not guilty of breaking the Sabbath by doing that. If you would have understood, you know, there's certain circumstances like with David, when he has man and he was hungry, that he was able to eat, you know, he, ate, he ended up eating that showbread which it wasn't lawful for him to eat. He's right. He said, you know what? That wasn't lawful for him to eat. We got to understand the law and why and the aspects behind this. So, um, but they would have known that had they just read. And, and reading the Bible will help you to figure out some of these situations that might seem kind of difficult. Well, what do I do in this situation? <clears throat> it's like the... Um, the, the, the example that comes to my mind right now is the Jehovah's Witnesses. They won't, um, they don't allow blood transfusions, right? And I forget what scripture they go to, but you know, all the, the there's life is in the blood and things like that. And they'll say, well, no, you can't do a blood transfusion. Like they're, they're willing to let someone die when, when they can be helped with this technique. And there's nothing in the Bible that says you can't do that. There's not. I mean, they're, they're taking stuff out of context and just saying that, nope, you can't do this. They're like the Pharisees who are just want to, you know, they don't even understand the law at all. And they're making up their own commandments, the commandments of men, not the commandments of God. But um, that's, what, that's what happens when you're not reading. And I mean, they're reading a, a whole another false version of the Bible anyways, which is even worse. Um, you're, not gonna, you're definitely not going to know what God's saying if you're not reading God's words. Uh, last place I'll be turning, turn to Proverbs chapter 1. 
I kind of mentioned this earlier, but one more reason of why. Why do we read the Bible? Well, we read the Bible to get instruction from God. We, need, we read the Bible to, for Him to light up our path. We read the Bible to stay humble, to be reliant on the Lord, to not get lifted up in pride. We, lead, we read the Bible also to get our prayers answered because by listening to God, you know, why would we expect God to listen to us if we're not listening to Him? If we're not going to take the time out of our day and read His Word and hear what He has for us, why would we expect God to take His time out to listen to us? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And the best way to, to use an analogy for that is just with, with children, with your own children. Right? If one of my daughters comes up to me and says, you know, oh, Dad, I want you to do this for me, or do that for me, or do this for me. Or I want you to fix my toy. I want, you know, well, did you do what I told you to do already? You know, I told you to go clean your room today. Did you do that? If they did, I'll be like, oh, okay, great. I'll help you out with what you need. If they didn't, I'm going to say, why don't you just go and do what I told you to do first? And then come to me with whatever this, whatever this other thing is that you want. Listen first. We need to be listening to God and, and receiving his instruction because, like I said before, I mean, oftentimes if we would just listen to him, we wouldn't have to go to him then later saying, hey, God, I got myself into trouble. Can you help me out here? Listen first. Proverbs 1, verse 23, the Bible says, Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you, because I have called and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. So he's saying, you know what? I'm going to pour my spirit upon you. I'm going to make my words known unto you. I'm going to help you to understand. Here's my words. I'm giving them to you. I'm calling out to you. Right? God's calling out to you. He's got his words. It's available at your fingertips right now. Calling out to you, but you refused. I stretched out my hand. No man regarded. Oh, I, don't want, I don't want to pick up that old thing. That's boring. I want to watch a TV show. I want to go listen to music. I want to read some other novel. Calling out to you, but you're refusing. You've said it not, all my counsel. It's like nothing. You got, you got the whole counsel of God here, but it's like nothing. You would none of my reproof. God's trying to correct you and saying, no, I don't have anything to do with it. Verse 26 says, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. So as a result of not wanting to choose the fear of the Lord, not wanting to get in his word, not wanting to receive instruction from him, well, when the bad times come your way, guess what? God's going to be up in heaven laughing at you and mocking. And yes, this is, this is what God's going to be doing. You say, well, it doesn't sound like God. Well, have you not read Proverbs chapter 1? Verse 27, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. And, and the bottom line there is just remember that if you don't want to listen to God, if you don't want to heed his instructions, if you don't want to hear what he has for you, you can't just always expect him to be there for you because you've gotten yourself into a big mess. There might come a point where he's just saying, you know, I'm just going to laugh, I'm going to mock at you now. I gave you all the opportunities. You had my word. I've been trying to correct you. I've been reaching out my hand to you, but you didn't want anything to do with me. So good luck with that. Have fun. God wants us to understand and know and, and, and know about him. And look, God is merciful and long-suffering and forgiving, and he provides us knowledge. And the Bible says, if anyone man, lacketh knowledge, you know, ask the Lord who upbraideth not, and he's gonna, he'll give it to you liberally. I mean, he'll give you the, the wisdom and knowledge and everything else that you're asking for. That's good. God wants you to be smart. He wants you to have wisdom. But you got to put forth some effort. You got to go out and collect the manna. You got to open up your Bible and start reading from the word and have the understanding that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So we don't just read the New Testament. We read the whole Bible. 
every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We read the Old Testament. We read the law. We read the old prophets. We read the book of Psalms. We read the book of Proverbs. We read all the New Testament too. We read it all because we want to have the whole picture. We want to have all the words of God. We want to receive all knowledge. There is so much more scripture on this topic. I didn't get into everything I could have. I mean, again, it makes sense. It's obvious we should know as believers in God's word, we should be reading God's word and understanding what it says and, and reading it regularly. I think there's a very good argument to be made. We should be reading it every single day. I don't think you could uh, oppose that from scripture. I think that's, that's found and it's found uh, very clearly in scripture. The final question then is, well, how much should I be reading? I mean, I'm reading every day, but how much should I be reading? That's an answer, a question that you're going to have to answer on your own. Okay. I think it's a good idea to read three times a day. It's, it's a good idea to read five times a day. Guess what? It's a good idea to read ten times a day. Okay. It's a good idea. You're going to have to determine for yourself what, is, what you think is enough, what you think God's going to be satisfied with, what, what you think is, is useful, where, where you're not just reading so much, where you're not gaining anymore, if you're not benefiting from it anymore. I mean, there's going to be that limit. Which is one of the reasons why I think it's good to kind of split up your reading a little bit if possible to, to get a little bit in the morning, maybe a little bit in the evening and, and even sometime in between, whatever, you know, to, to make sure your mind is, is, is fresh to, to handle, you know, and to get the most out of what you're reading. And it doesn't just become, I mean, sometimes you be reading and you're really enthralled and you can read for quite a while and, and absorb a lot. And that's great, you know, but kind of pay attention to that. But what our challenge is going to be, because we're doing a challenge, right? And the challenge is meant to, to maybe push you a little bit. I don't know. If you're already doing these things, then praise God. That's awesome. You're going to go well with this challenge. Challenge yourself uh, some other way. But we've got, Brother Robert, you please come up here. We've got um, this Bible reading chart. So we've got one for the guys. And one for the ladies, right? The, the, the butterflies are for the ladies and the guns are for the guys. This is a chart to help you because our goal is we're going to read the entire New Testament in the month of May. The entire New Testament. It's 31 days and you'll get through the entire New Testament. Now, don't be daunted. This is not that difficult a test. When you start looking at this, it, broken down for you already. It's roughly eight chapters a day. Okay? You can do this. It's a, I mean, it's totally, and, and this isn't that, I mean, some people do this regularly, to be honest with you. This much reading that, we're, that I'm handing out right now, some people just do this as their normal Bible reading. For some people, and I, maybe some people in this church, I don't know. I mean, I don't ask everybody what you're, you know, what you're doing at home and how you're serving God all on your own. It doesn't matter. But I do know for a fact some people are reading this much. And um, if it's not a challenge for you, then challenge yourself more. But the reason why I say that there's some people that do this is because don't think it's impossible. I mean, there's people already, this is, this is every single day. This isn't just the month of May for them. This is just what they do normally. But if this is a challenge for you, this is a good challenge, okay? Get through the, the New Testament, see if you can do it in that month. And hopefully, and this is why we had the redeeming the time challenge in April to give you a little bit more time, make sure you're, you're getting rid of some of the, the XX Facebook time or whatever is kind of wasting a little bit of your time. Now you can use it reading your Bible a little bit. And another good way to stay up with this is to split up, do some in the morning and some in the evening or something along those lines. Day one, tomorrow, Matthew 1, chapters 1 through 8. If you do one through four in the morning, five through eight in the evening, splits it up. It doesn't seem as, as, as you know, too bad. Use, use whatever time you can and, you know, and it's, that's very reasonable. Reading four chapters about Matthew one through four will probably only take you, I don't know, 15 minutes. So, 20 maybe, I don't know. I mean, it depends how fast you read. We're not, we're not trying to do speed reading. We're trying to get everything, you know, receive everything that you're reading. But I mean, it's, it's really not a lot. You can get through this. And um, so I encourage everybody to, to participate in this challenge. If you, um, if you do participate, we're going to be having a prize for this, 
for this challenge. So anyone who's able to complete the New Testament by the end of the month, by the end of May, you know, May 31st, you get all the, the whole New Testament read, then you'll, you'll earn yourself a special prize, kind of like we do with the Bible memory. So uh, hopefully you'll participate. And again, the goal with this is to, is to understand the importance of reading the Bible and, and to make sure you're setting apart enough time and hopefully form some new habits in your Bible reading also. Kind of like we're doing with the prayer. Kind of like we're doing with the soul winning. You see where we're going with these? I mean, we're going to be doing these challenges every year. We're going to try to, to build on it more and more and to help you to, to, to become more spiritual. Help me to become more spiritual. I mean, I, I focus on these things. It helps me out too. Let's not forget the previous challenges, but let's keep adding and keep building and keep doing more. Spire Reds, I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the, the great instruction and wisdom and knowledge that you provide for us, dear God. Pray that you would please stir up our, our hearts and our minds, Lord, to, um, to be mindful of that, to, be, to, to understand the true value of what we, we possess in our hands and when we open up the Bible, Lord, that we actually literally have your words. That, that you know, so many people wish they could hear you audibly, but we, we, we have your words written for us. We, we have instruction. We have, we have what you want us to know already at our fingertips, God. Pray that you please help us to be, to be mindful of that, to treat it as such, not to treat it as a bore or a chore or as just something that we, we just have to do, but something that we want to do because we want to learn more, we want to grow, we want to know more about you, and we want to know more about us and how we ought to live, dear God. Pray for your guidance and your instruction, Lord. Help us to, to make the time that is necessary to do these things, that we are, that we are leading a life um, that is going to be honorable in your sight, dear Lord, and that we could bring the, the most honor and glory unto your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.